can, but we could make it better. We could make it more efficient. We could amend it, but we're prohibited from doing that. I think the time for simply saying no, 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 no uh, is gone, and I think the gentleman's amendment is wrong, and I would reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I would say to the gentleman that in light of what we have today, with the uncertainty, with the sequester, with the reduction in funds where we are saving money by furloughing federal employees, now is not the time to spend more money in this realm of uncertainty, especially when the Secretary of Defense is undertaking a strategic choices and management review to determine what our strategy should be going forward. Certainly we ought to determine the strategy first before we're going to make additional expenditures on closing bases. Also, there's a current evaluation going on with our facilities in Europe and our facilities in the Pacific. Shouldn't we finish that first before we start even considering closing bases here in the United States, where, by the way, we still haven't gotten to the point of saving money from the last BRAC round, which will take at least 13 years to save money. So if we start another one that would take another 13 years, are we in the position to spend more money to do that while we have these areas of uncertainty surrounding us, a sequester resulting in furloughs, an evaluation of the current strategy for the United States, a evaluation of base structures in other areas of the world? I say that this is absolutely the wrong time to pursue a BRAC in any way, shape, or form, to propose, plan, or execute a BRAC in all those areas. Let's create some certainty with what's happening right now with this nation's defense, with what we're doing with planning, to make sure it's a logical, a thoughtful process where there's some certainty, not throwing more uncertainty into the process, which is what a BRAC round would do now. Mr. Chairman, with that, I yield the balance of my time. Excuse me, I will uh, reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Indiana is recognized. Uh, I will reserve and understand I have the right to close. Mm -hmm. the gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, I, I, I want to e emphasize this time in our nation's defense budgeting, we ought to be looking at where we can save dollars, where we can apply dollars to those areas of greatest need. And I argue those areas of greatest need are for this nation's readiness. The training of our troops, the operation and maintenance of our equipment, making sure that we get those dollars there. And that if, before we pursue a BRAC, we ought to know what the other areas are where we are going to go with this nation's strategy, with what our base structure should be in other areas of the world. And after being at war for nearly 12 years, now we have a well-trained, battle-hardened, combat-tested combat force and they are an all-volunteer force that's more joint than ever. We want to understand where we need to be going forward to make sure that we provide for them. Closing these bases now, or even pursuing a base realignment and closure commission, is not the time to do that. Mr. Chairman, again, this is the wrong time. We ought to be looking at the place in time where we have actually accrued the savings on the last BRAC, which started in 2005, before we pursue another, we ought to make sure we know what this nation's strategy is militarily before we pursue a base realignment closure commission. We ought to know what should our base structures be elsewhere in the world before we pursue a base realignment closure commission here in the United States. We ought to make sure we understand where we're going with the sequester, where we're going with furloughs, where we're going with end strength with our military before we close bases. We're going to be reducing end strength by 100,000 and say, by the way, let's pursue a base realignment and closure commission now. How do we know where we need to be? That uncertainty is not where we need to be, and I urge my expired. colleagues to vote in favor of this amendment. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Indiana is recognized. I appreciate that the gentleman uh, on any number of occasions during his discussion talked about the uncertainty that we face in this country because of sequestration, and I couldn't agree with him more. Uh, and would point out that the gentleman voted for the Budget Control Act that created sequestration that has now created the uncertainty that we face, which I find very regrettable. The gentleman also, in his concluding remarks, indicated that we need to look to save money. Couldn't agree with him more. He also indicated, and I would accept it for the sake of our discussion here on the House floor, that some of these processes take 13 years. I think the gentleman makes my argument. If it takes 13 years, we ought to start today so that that child who is born later this week 
has the benefit of the savings we both want before they get to high school. Why wait to save the American taxpayers money by potentially not considering a plan? I think we ought to be thoughtful here. And I oppose the gentleman's amendment. I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from, Gin from Virginia. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. No. Opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. It's now in order to consider amendment number 40, printed in House Report 113-170. It's now in order to consider amendment number 41, printed in House Report 113-170. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number 41, printed in House Report number 113-170, offered by Mr. Flores of Texas. Pursuant to House Resolution 312, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Flores, and a member opposed each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I rise to offer an amendment which addresses another misguided and restrictive federal regulation. Section 526 of the Energy Independence and Security Act prohibits federal agencies from entering into contracts for the procurement of fuels unless their life cycle greenhouse gas emissions are less than or equal to emissions from an equivalent conventional, jet, uh, conventional fuel produced from conventional petroleum sources. My amendment is simple. It would stop the government from enforcing this ban on agencies funded by the Department of Defense Appropriations Bill. As my good friend Mr. Terry from Nebraska said a few minutes ago, the initial purpose of Section 526 was to stifle the Defense Department's plans to buy and develop coal-based or coal to liquids jet fuel. We can must ensure that our military has adequate fuel resources and that it can rely on domestic and more stable sources of fuel. One of the unintended consequences of Section 526 is that it essentially forces the American military to acquire fuel refined from un unstable Middle East crude re resources. I offered this amendment to the fiscal year 2014 Homeland Security Appropriations Bill and the fiscal 2014 Energy and Water Appropriations Bill, and they both passed on the floor of the House with strong bipartisan support. My friend Mr. Conaway from Texas also added similar language to the late defense authorization bill to exempt the Defense Department from this burdensome regulation. At this time, Mr. Chairman, I now yield two minutes to my good friend from Texas, Mr. Conaway. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, thank my good friend from Texas. Uh, I also want to encourage my colleagues to vote in favor of this amendment. Section 526 was added to the 2007 Energy Bill as a last-minute add-on with no hearings, without any information about it whatsoever, and it is beyond misguided. Uh, they sound good on paper, but it is totally unenforceable. No one in their right mind has a clue what the greenhouse, life cycle greenhouse gases are for any of the fuels that, uh, that anybody buys. And quite frankly, as we uh, blend crude oil sources at a refinery, uh, to, uh, to run through the refiner on a most efficient basis. There is absolutely no way to separate out the gasoline, jet fuel, diesel that comes from that refining that would be required if, say, some uh, uh, crude oil, if we, let's assume for the sake of this conversation, that we actually get the Keystone Pipeline done, some of that oil from uh, Canada starts flowing south into our refineries. Uh, there is absolutely no way anyone could certify uh, which gasoline is coming out is related to those sources versus some others. So this is misguided, it's unworkable and, uh, and extreme. I would prefer that we exempt the entire, all of government from Section 526, but that's obviously beyond the scope of tonight's legislation. And uh, I want to thank my friend uh, Mr. Flores, Mr. Hensling, Mr. Gingry for uh, again proposing this uh, uh, striking or exempting Department of Defense from the uh, misguided requirements of Section 526. And I encourage all of my colleagues to vote for it, and I yield back. Jumping yields back. Mr. Jump Chairman, as we said right earlier, this amendment is a simple fix, and that fix is to not restrict our fuel choices based on bad policies or misguided regulations like those in Section 526. Stopping the impact of Section 526 will help us to promote American energy, grow the American economy, create American jobs, and become more energy secure. 
I urge my colleagues to support my amendment. And at this time, I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman from Reserves, what brought purchases the gentleman from Indiana seek recognition? I rise to claim the time in opposition to the gentleman's amendment. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I won't prolong the debate uh, because this is either the third or fourth uh, installment, if you would, of this debate. Uh, but my response uh, to the current iteration is the same as I have expressed uh, throughout the night. Uh, we do have an energy problem in the United States of America. And I do agree with former Senator Richard Lugar that it is first and foremost a national security issue given where we get petroleum products. We've been at war in the Middle East. We've been at war in Afghanistan. We have other problems internationally, much of it precipitated because of our dependence on that fuel. Uh, this is not uh, the time, I believe, uh, that we ought to in any way, shape, or form uh, retard the largest consumer of energy in this country uh, from examining and helping to create a vibrant market for alternatives to reduce that. So for those reasons and the reasons discussed earlier in this evening's uh, debate, uh, I would uh, be opposed to the gentleman's amendment and would reserve the balance of my time. Jump from reserves. Jump from Texas is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I've enjoyed the, uh, the debate tonight, and I appreciate the comments of, of the gentleman. I would say this. This amendment does not do any of those things that he said it would. It does not prevent and it does not restrict the ability of the federal government or the Department of Defense to purchase any alternative fuels. It does not restrict those, including biodiesel, ethanol, or other fuels from renewable resources. So it does not do any of those things that would prevent the flexibility from the de Department of Defense in acquiring fuels. As a matter of fact, it helps the Department of Defense have more flexibility. And with that, I urge my colleagues to support this bill, and I yield back. Gentleman, gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The I yield back Indiana's the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Texas. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. no. You pin the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. I request the yeas and aye. Does the gentleman request a roll, recorded vote? The gentleman requests a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Texas will be postponed. It's now in order to consider Amendment Number 42, printed in House Report 113-170. For what purpose does the gentleman from Oklahoma seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment Number 42, printed in House Report Number 113-170, offered by Mr. Cole of Oklahoma. Pursuant to House Resolution 312, the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Cole, and a member each will control, opposed each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oklahoma. Five Thank minutes. you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, yield myself one minute. Gentleman's recognized. I'm offering a bipartisan amendment this evening, Mr. Chairman, to prevent funds from the uh, so-called working capital fund from being used to implement furloughs of DOD employees. This amendment would affect approximately 180,000 workers scattered around the country in different working capital fund units. Uh, Tinker, Hill, Robbins, the great air logistics centers account for 26,000 of those. Uh, working class, or excuse me, working uh, capital fund employees are indirectly funded by uh, the government uh, and not by direct appropriations. The commands where these employees are paid have more than sufficient funds uh, to continue to operate without a furlough. Indeed, furloughing these workers would be counterproductive and ultimately cost money. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ye uh, reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves the balance of his time. For what purpose? I rise to claim time in opposition to the gentleman's amendment. The gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Uh, I appreciate the gentleman's concern and the fact that uh, he is focused on working capital uh, that is essentially funded through customer reimbursement. But as I mentioned in an earlier debate, uh, am opposed to the gentleman's amendment. Uh, I voted against the Budget Control Act. I think sequestration is an abhorrent way to run the government. I was disappointed last year when we made every federal agency in this nation, including the Department of Defense, wait seven months until we told them how much money we're going to give them. And then almost most of the agencies, we then told them, well, we're just going to give you what we gave you last year. Uh, now we're suffering because of furloughs. 
And the concern I have here, again, is making distinctions between one federal employee and another. Uh, they're all very important. Uh, I don't know what going to work every day as a guard in a maximum security federal prison must be like. Uh, but I don't know that we've carved out an exception for them. Uh, I don't know what it is like to be a federal law enforcement official uh, working undercover, putting your life at risk, getting reimbursed, uh, but not being carved out for a furlough. Uh, we have people at NIH, National Institutes of Health, doing groundbreaking research as far as people's health and safety, and perhaps they not themselves are risking their lives. Uh, but tomorrow, if they were at work, could make a discovery that could improve or prolong someone's life. And I think it's a very difficult proposition to begin to make those distinctions between various federal employees. Uh, I absolutely share the gentleman's concern as to what is happening with the federal workforce. I have mentioned in committee and on this floor more than once today that I'm appalled that for four years we hold federal employees in so little regard. Uh, we have not given any of them a raise in four years. Uh, but we scurried, we scurried to the floor because people were going to be inconvenienced on the House uh, floor, not the House floor, at airports uh, because of potential slowdowns at the FAA. Well, federal employees actually do things for our safety, like make sure when we leave the ground in an airplane, we're safe. Uh, so again, I'm very concerned here. Uh, the fact is, allowing exceptions for one agency, I do think, is unfair to others. Allowing exceptions that pit one agency against another wrongly determines the value of the work performed by some government employees vis-a-vis -vis others. Uh, we ought to value all of their work collectively together and should not be looking for temporary fixes of one dislocation as great as it is uh, caused by sequestration. Uh, what we ought to be about, and I know the gentleman is about that, uh, is to end uh, this madness, if you would, and get back to the business of governing this country. Uh, I would reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Oklahoma is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, uh, extend one minute's worth of time to my good friend from the state of Washington, new member uh, from the 6th District. Gentleman from Washington is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I rise in support of this amendment, and let me take a second here to say I oppose sequestration, I oppose the furloughs, and I believe Congress should be working, moving forward on a plan to eliminate sequestration um, and the process of furloughing workers. But Congress hasn't done that, and now we're forced to deal with an ugly process where we're cutting accounts and furloughing workers, not because it makes any sense for the public interest or for our national security, but because Congress can't get its act together. This amendment responds to what I believe was an incorrect decision by the Department of Defense to furlough civilian workers who work at entities that were funded through defense working capital accounts. The working capital funds are revolving funds that provide goods and services across the DOD that were established to promote stable pricing and reliable access. They were designed to be self-sustaining, and I certainly empathize with the other workers and groups that uh, are facing furloughs, but these workers are not funded through direct appropriation. I believe that, this indirectly funded, uh, that these indirectly funded employees are specifically exempted by law uh, from sequestration. Furthermore, I believe that furloughing these employees and thereby delaying their work will not save any money, will only increase the cost for DOD and hurt taxpayers and jeopardize their military readiness. And Time I thank of the, the gentleman, gentleman has thank expired. You. Gentleman from Indiana is recognized. I would reserve my time. The gentleman from Reserves, the gentleman from Oklahoma is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield one minute to distinguish the majority whip from the great state of California. The gentleman from California is recognized. Well, I thank the gentleman, and Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of this amendment. This issue is straightforward. It deals with defense working capital funds. Now, this is just like owning a business. When you provide a service or a product, you get paid for it. That is how defense working capital funds operate. They are paid through reimbursements for the services they provide to the Department of Defense, which is already funded for the fiscal year. Thus, working capital funds do not receive direct appropriations, and therefore furloughing these individuals have no savings. They actually have the direct opposite effect. It'll cost you more, there'll be delays, and most importantly, individuals will be harmed in the process.
The specialized work that Defense Working Capital Fund employees perform is vital to our nation's security and our war fighters around the globe. A blanket 11-day furlough policy such as China Lake in my district will only end up slowing down our war fighters, the best and latest technology to complete their mission when called upon to perfect and defend America and safely return home to their families. This is very simple. They do not effect inside a furlough. They are a business that performs work and they get paid for it and the money is already there. That's why I ask and urge all of us to join in supporting this amendment. Time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Indiana is recognized. I would reserve my time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Oklahoma is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield one minute to the distinguished gentleman from Utah, my colleague on the Rules Committee, and my classmate, Mr. Bishop. Gentleman from Utah is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As stated, this workload is a self-sustaining process, which means if the workload is there, and it is, then the money is there, and it is. To furlough the employees in this area saves no money, it, comp it completes no work, but it does raise the cost of overhead for all of the depots. Look, I have empathy for the Pentagon. They made a decision that everyone should pay share the pain in an effort to be fair. Unfortunately, Section 10, or Title 10, Section uh, 2472, tells us how this fund should be managed. Sharing the pain ain't one of the options. I appreciate what is going on here, but the Defense Department need, cannot simply pick and choose. This amendment does not start a new program. It simply requires that the existing law be followed. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Indiana is recognized. I would reserve my time. The gentleman from Oklahoma is recognized. Now, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, yield one minute to my good friend from the great state of Iowa, Mr. Loebsack. The gentleman from Iowa is recognized for one minute. All right. Uh, I want to thank my friend from Oklahoma for yielding one minute. I am a proud co-sponsor of this truly bipartisan amendment, as demonstrated by those who are speaking in favor of it tonight. I, too, voted against sequestration, and I oppose furloughing any DOD citizens who work on behalf of our national security and our troops. Those working at the Rock Island Arsenal, which I represent, proudly serve our country. They don't deserve a pay cut because of Washington's dysfunction. It's as simple as that. That's why Congress and the administration must find a balanced, common-sense way to replace sequestration. This amendment addresses the unique situation of work, the working capital fund civilians, like those at the Joint Manufacturing and Technology Center, who are already funded from prior years. I think that's important to keep in mind. Furloughing these men and women doesn't create direct savings, as has already been mentioned. Rather, it delays work for our troops, it hurts our readiness, and it increases costs for taxpayers without direct savings. Again, I oppose all furloughs, and I do oppose sequestration. This amendment, I believe, is a common-sense policy for DOD and for working capital fund employees, and I urge my colleagues to support it. Again, it's a fully bipartisan amendment. Time Thank of the you. gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Indiana is recognized. I reserve my time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Oklahoma is recognized with 15 seconds remaining for the gentleman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield the balance of my time to my good friend from the great state of Georgia, Mr. Scott. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized for 15 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is a sensible bipartisan solution. It helps the country by helping those who work at our depots and other areas. And I would just ask that my colleagues join uh, this bipartisan coalition that's working in support of this amendment. With that, I yield the remainder of the time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Indiana is recognized. Time back. The gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Oklahoma. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The chair understands that amendment number 43 will not be offered. It's now in order to consider amendment number 44 printed in House Report 113-170. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Connecticut seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number 44 printed in House Report number 113-170 offered by Ms. DeLauro of Connecticut. Pursuant to House Resolution 312, the gentlewoman from Connecticut, Ms. DeLauro, and a member opposed each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Connecticut for five minutes. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, my amendment would prohibit funds in this bill from being used by the Defense Department to train the Afghan Special Mission Wing to operate or maintain Russian-made MI-17 helicopters. Over 93,000 people have died in a tragic war in Syria that is being fueled by Russian arms being supplied to the Assad regime. 
Over 1.6 million Syrian refugees are now hosted across five countries. By the end of the year, half the population of Syria will be in need of aid. We know for a fact that the Russian arms manufacturer, Rosaboran Export, is arming Syria. The Syrian armament Army requested 20,000 Kalashnikov assault rifles, 20 million rounds of ammunition, machine guns, grenade launchers, grenades, and sniper rifles with night vision sights. And Russia also recently announced it would provide Assad with advanced S-300 missile defense batteries. Yet, our Defense Department continues to channel business to this Russian arms manufacturer. DOD recently skirted around a prohibition on purchasing MI-17 helicopters from Russia's state arms dealer in last year's defense appropriation bill, signing a contract with Rosa Boran Export to procure 30 MI-17s for the Afghan Specialty Mission Wing using 2012 Afghanistan Security Forces Fund monies. This contract signing flying in the face of congressional intent, incredibly came just days after this House voted 423 to zero to strengthen the prohibition on Pentagon business with the Russian arms dealer, a prohibition also included in this defense appropriations bill. Even more egregious, it also came on the heels of a report by the, spe the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction that recommended suspension of the plans to purchase these helicopters for the Afghan Special Mission Wing, as the Afghans do not even have the capacity to use them. The Defense Department touts the 30 years of experience the Afghans have with the MI-17 helicopters as a key reason to purchase them. Yet, we are still trying to train them to fly these helicopters instead of American-made helicopters training that the Inspector General report says has been slow and uneven. The report also argues that moving forward with the acquisition of these MI-17 helicopters is highly imprudent until, among other things, an agreement is reached on NATO's Afghanistan training mission, training mission concept for reorganization within the Afghan government to support the special mission wing. Mr. Speaker, U.S. taxpayers should not be subsidizing the Russian state arms dealer that is fueling the war in Syria. The language already included in this bill states this. We should also not be spending money to train an Afghan unit to fly these Russian helicopters, particularly when the Inspector General has raised serious questions about the content of that unit's capabilities. I urge for uh, support for my amendment, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves the balance of her time. For what purpose, Mr. Yes. Gentleman? I uh, rise to claim time in opposition to the amendment. Gentleman from California is recognized. Uh, Five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the Afghan National Army Special <laughs> Forces are the most capable component of the Afghan National Security Forces, and they've made significant strides toward becoming an independent and effective force in Afghanistan. The only path forward to getting out of Afghanistan is to make sure that we have an effective uh, army, special force, that can do the necessary work to make sure that the fragile Afghan governance that is there survives. The purpose of this amendment is not to limit the Afghan special forces, but to further restrict the use of the helicopter it employs to support its mission. The development of the Afghan Army Special Operations remain a critical component of the overall operation structure and strategy to sustain the transition to Afghan security lead. In other words, if we want to get out of there by 2014, 2015, the Afghan Air Force must succeed. And it has a history, whether we like it or not, with the MI-17. It's the most more efficient to expand its fleet build on their existing knowledge of maintaining that fleet than to completely shift to an entirely different aircraft. And, and additionally, U.S. helicopters are more technologically advanced. They're a better helicopter, I'll agree. But it would further prolong the timelines of getting the AF ready to need, go to where they need to be to completely take over the program. 
The MI-17 has been certified by the Department of Defense and it was to be the right aircraft for the missions in Afghanistan. The MI-17 has a long history in Afghanistan and was designed for high altitude terrain there. So uh, I reluctantly oppose the gentlelady's amendment and uh, would reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman, gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Connecticut. Gentleman from Connecticut is recognized. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, how much time is left? One and a half minutes for the gentleman from Connecticut. Thank you. I just want to uh, I, I say to my, my good friend that um, I think that we ought to be uh, amenable to working with uh, Afghanistan in these, in these final days, but I don't make up this information. Our Defense Department continues to channel business to this Russian arms manufacturer. Uh, DOD skirted around the prohibition on purchasing MI-17 helicopters uh, in, uh, uh, in the last appropriations bill. We voted uh, overwhelmingly, uh, I don't know that there's been a vote in this House on a bipartisan basis that was 423 to zero to prohibit this. So what did the DOD do? The DOD went around that, went to a different pot of money, and one could acknowledge that, but in addition to acknowledging that, I'm going to quote to you from the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction. Afghan Special Mission Wing. DOD plans to spend $908 million to build air wing that the Afghans cannot operate and maintain. Now, I don't know why we keep in business an inspector general that would give us this report and then we fly in the face of it and not acknowledge its veracity. Uh, in addition to which, we are dealing with an arms dealer that is supplying arms, grenades, Kalashnikovs, missiles to Syria where over 93,000 people have already have already been killed. The point is that we shouldn't enter a contract Time when the there is no capability has to fly these helicopters. Time the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from California is recognized. I thank the gentleman. Again, uh, we're not talking about a helicopter manufacturer that, uh, that would suffer. It's the combat unit in Afghanistan that would be devastated and unable to fulfill its mission. And if it's not able to fulfill its mission, then we will not have a capable military to take over when the United States leaves in 2014. I'm not going to defend uh, Russia or, or their foreign policy and what they're doing in Syria. Uh, but we do want Afghanistan to succeed. And so uh, I reluctantly uh, must oppose the gentlelady's amendment. And I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Connecticut. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. No. Pin in the chair, the ayes have it. Oh, amendment no. is agreed to. I would uh, ask for a roll call vote. Yeah. California asks for a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California will be postponed. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Connecticut will be postponed. It's now in order to consider Amendment Number 45, printed in House Report 113-170. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from California seek recognition? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I have. An amendment at the desk. Clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number 45, printed in House Report number 113-170, offered by Ms. Lee of California. Pursuant to House Resolution 312, the gentleman from California, Ms. Lee, and the member opposed each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California for five thank, minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, uh, let me thank Congressman Polis, Blumenauer, Conyers, and Schrader, who have joined me in offering this amendment. Our amendment is very straightforward. It would trim Pentagon spending by a very modest 1%. The Congressional Budget Office estimates our amendment would result in a reduction of discretionary spending of $5.9 billion, and it does so while maintaining our national security and protecting our active duty military personnel. This defense appropriations bill is $28.1 billion more than the Pentagon's current funding level, which includes 
five billion more than the president's request for war spending in the overseas contingency account in total this bill includes over eighty five billion dollars in war spending at a time when the majority of the american people and a growing bipartisan group in congress are calling for an expedited end of military activities in afghanistan our amendment simply takes the total amount in the bill reduces that amount by one percent and then allows the Department of Defense to choose what accounts to take the reduction from. As I mentioned before, military personnel accounts and medical and health care programs are exempt from this amendment. Mr. Chairman, month after month, we have been talking about ways to address the budget and the impacts of the harmful sequester. The question before the body is, today is, how do we ensure that we have a budget that reflects our national security priorities our moral values, and our underlying economic strength. I'm talking about a budget that protects the most vulnerable in our country and a budget that ensures that we have priorities to create jobs and turn this economy around. In other words, nation building in our own country. What this amendment does is say that we need to put everything on the table, and I mean everything, and that includes the Pentagon. Believe me, if I could, I would support much greater cuts to the Pentagon, but surely $5 billion can be found among the tens of billions of dollars lost each year, each year at the Pentagon due to waste, fraud, and abuse. And you know that that $5 billion is a mere drop in the bucket when you look at what has been actually uh, taken away without knowledge of where that money has gone. When you look at the cash the suitcases filled with cash in Afghanistan and previously in Iraq. Even with this modest cut of 1%, the Pentagon-based budget would still far outpace any other nation in defense spending. The United States spends as much on its military as 13 countries combined. But all three of these are close allies. When you look at this, and I'm talking about China, Russia, the United Kingdom, France, Japan, India, Saudi Arabia, Germany, and of course Brazil, Italy, South Korea, Australia, Canada, Canada, excuse me, combined we spend more than those countries. Finally, Americans believe that no federal agency should really be immune from cuts, including the Pentagon. In fact, the average American would pursue a much larger cut of over $93 billion, according to a poll released in 2012 by the Stimson Center. So it's long past overdue that um, we be honest with the American people and begin to have some real debate about deficit reduction, job creation, and the reduction of spending, and that includes the Pentagon. So I urge my colleagues to support this amendment, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman from California reserves. For what purpose does the gentleman from California seek recognition? This amendment. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, I'm the first to admit that the Department of Defense should not be immune to reasonably uh, based reductions. We should, uh, we should be doing that. And that's exactly what we've been doing the past few years and will continue to do this year. This bill, this bill that we're deciding today and tomorrow, is $3.4 billion below the President's request. And in fact, over the past three fiscal years, this committee has produced defense budgets which totaled $71 billion below the request, only 32 of which have been due to sequestration. The department is already facing another $44 billion, an arbitrary reduction in spending, if we don't stop sequestration from going into effect in FY 2014. Any further immediate and arbitrary reductions would likely bring the department to a grinding halt, perhaps past the point of recovery. Specifically, reductions could require reducing, canceling training for returning troops, canceling Navy training exercises, reducing Air Force flight training, delaying or canceling maintenance of aircraft, ships, and vehicles, and delaying important safety and quality of life repairs to facilities and military barracks. Finally, the allocation of this bill is essentially in line with both the Ryan budget as well as the defense authorization bill. National security should not be subject to partisan politics. Instead, we should show our support 
for those brave men and women who have sacrificed so much and continue to do so. I strongly oppose this amendment, and I yield whatever time to my friend from India. I appreciate the gentleman for Indiana yielding. Uh, and I appreciate the gentleman, gentlewoman's uh, approach. Uh, I have on more than one occasion in talking about the Department of Defense at uh, my constituency indicated that, as the gentleman noted, no one should be immune from cuts. Uh, and if you can't find one cent out of every dollar at the Department of Defense to save, there's something wrong with the leadership at the Department of Defense. But I rise in reluctant opposition for two reasons. One is I have an inherent objection to across the board cuts because I think we ought to make sure we're very targeted as far as our financial decisions. And secondly, given the across the board cut that has been referenced of more than 30 billion dollars in the current fiscal year because of sequestration under a bill I voted against, uh, we are talking in this instance about filling a significant arbitrary hole. And so again, would uh, reluctantly uh, be opposed to the gentlewoman's amendment and appreciate the gentleman for yielding. Gentleman from California Reserves. Reserve the balance point. Gentleman, woman from California is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. How much time do I have remaining? The gentlewoman has one and a half minutes remaining. Okay, thank you very much. Let me um, first thank our, our ranking member for his comments and just uh, reiterate the fact that while this is a 1% uh, cut across the board, it allows the Pentagon to make those decisions about where the Pentagon and our military officials believe that uh, the money, sh where the cut should come from and how to reallocate our funds. Certainly as the daughter of a veteran, 25 years, uh, I'm an Army brat, I recognize and support our young men and women who have been placed in harm's way and who have sacrificed so much for our country. And there's no way that I would offer an, an amendment that would harm our troops. Uh, a 1% cut really forces us uh, to pause, quite frankly, and it forces us to look at where we can find savings when we scrutinize the Pentagon budget, the same way that we scrutinize our domestic discretionary spending. At a time when American families, businesses, and government agencies are facing budget cuts, why shouldn't the Pentagon be asked to become more efficient and eliminate waste, fraud, and abuse? And let me reiterate that this bill includes $5 billion more than the President's request for the overseas contingency account. And so it makes no sense. We need to begin to focus our resources on nation building at home, ensure our national security, and really make sure that uh, all of our agencies begin to look at waste, fraud, and abuse. And certainly the Pentagon should be the first to do that, uh, especially given the fact that we have not had audit requirements of the Pentagon and still don't know what um, type of resources there have been um, wasted and misallocated. And so I ask um, for support for this very modest amendment. Time of the gentlewoman has expired. The gentleman from California is recognized. Again, uh, in opposition to this amendment, we have made significant cuts in our national defense and continue to do so. Uh, we're at the lowest levels as a percentage of GDP in, sp in expenditures for our national security in a long time. So uh, I would rise in opposition to this amendment and would urge a no vote. Gentlemen, yield back. back the balance of my time. Questions on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from California. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. No. Pinning the chair, the noes have it. The amendment or is not agreed to. a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from California will be postponed. It's now in order to consider amendment number 46, printed in House Report 113-170. For what purpose does the gentleman, well, the gentleman from Illinois seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will designate the amendment. I move to dispense with the reading. Clerk will designate the amendment. Clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number 46, printed in House Report number 113-170, offered by Mr. Quigley of Illinois. Pursuant to House Resolution 312, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Quigley, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois for five Thank minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my amendment is very straightforward. It simply reduces the number of deployed intercontinental ballistic missiles, nuclear missiles, by a third, from 450 to 300. 
We are in the midst of an extraordinary budget crisis. We are facing unsustainable debt. <clears throat> and yet we continue to spend approximately 50 to 55 billion annually to maintain and even grow a nuclear arsenal and associated programs designed for a Cold War that no longer exist. Russia is no longer the existential threat it once was, and we are working closely with Russian leaders to reduce our nuclear arsenals together. While other nations such as China have some nuclear weapons, their stockpiles pale in comparison. China has no more than 50 to 75 single warhead intercontinental ballistic missiles. We can significantly reduce our nuclear arsenal of 1,700 and still maintain a robust military edge over any rival. As we look to reduce our nuclear stockpile, we should be strategic and make targeted cuts. <clears throat> According to a recent report issued by General James Cartwright, retired vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and former commander of the U.S. Nuclear Forces, Ch Secretary Chuck Hagel and a number of other military and foreign experts, <clears throat> all land-based ICBMs could be eliminated. Let me take a moment to repeat that. The former commander of all nu U.S. nuclear forces think we don't need any ICBMs. None. According to the report, the U.S. ICBM force has lost its central utility. The report outlines four key reasons ICBMs should be eliminated. First, direct wartime nuclear operations against Russia alone were Cold War scenarios that no longer are plausible. Second, flight paths over all land-based ICBMs to any potential adversary, Iran, North Korea, China, would have to travel through Russian airspace. This could trigger quote, confusing Russia and triggering nuclear retaliation. Third, U.S. Trident submarines and B-2 strategic bombers can deliver nuclear weapons to any point on the Earth. Fourth, ICBMs and fixed silos are inherently targetable. But once again, these are not my assessments or the assessments of some anti-nuclear group. <clears throat> these are the assessments of General Cartwright, the retired vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and former commander of U.S. nuclear forces. Richard Burt, a former chief nuclear arms negotiator. Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel, former ambassador to Russia Thomas Pickering, and General John Sheehan, a former senior NATO official. The former commander of U.S. nuclear forces has issued his support for the elimination of ICBMs. This amendment merely calls for a reduction by one-third. We have limited resources, and that means we have to make choices. As we look to cut spending, Let's cut military investments that do nothing to keep us safe in today's threat environment, such as ICBMs. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I reserve. General Reserves, for what purpose of the gentleman from Montana, from Montana seek recognition? <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition to this amendment. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I stand in strong opposition to this amendment, which amounts to the unilateral reduction of our nuclear forces. Unilateral reductions of our nuclear forces are wrong for national security, period. These reductions have been directly and explicitly recommended against by the Joint Chiefs and senior DOD civilian officials, all who have said that reductions must be made bilaterally in concert with Russia. I am deeply concerned that not only is this proposal to unilaterally disarm unwise, it's also short-sighted. It could seriously diminish the long-term security of our nation. We face a world today in which nuclear threats to the United States are increasing and our conventional military capabilities face dramatic reductions. Given this, our nuclear deterrent is becoming more important, not less. Malmstrom Air Force Base in my home state of Montana is home to 150 of our nation's intercontinental ballistic missiles. Earlier this year, I visited Malmstrom and I met with the leaders of the 341st Missile Wing to discuss the importance of our ICBM mission to our national security. Colonel Robert W. Stanley, the commander at Malmstrom, gave me this commander's coin. It bears a motto that truly sums up why our defense strategy is effective. And it says this, scaring the hell out of America's enemies since 1962. This model clearly demonstrates the importance of our peace through strength strategy. We cannot underestimate the role that our strong nuclear defenses have played in keeping America secure and maintaining peace, not only with Russia, but throughout the world. 
In fact, some say we've never had to use our ICBMs. I would argue we use them every day to ensure that the world is a safer place. That's why I urge my colleagues to also support the amendment that I've introduced alongside Congressman Lambord, Congresswoman Lummis, and Congressman Kramer. Our amendment will help keep America safe by maintaining a strong nuclear deterrent and preventing the Obama administration from pursuing efforts to unilaterally reduce our nuclear arsenal. The Obama administration requested funds in their 2014 budget proposal to do environmental impact studies of our ICBMs, which is widely seen as a backdoor to attempt to reduce our ICBM fleet. Our amendment simply prohibits this study. Now is not the time to reduce our ICBM fleet, which is why I would urge all of my colleagues to oppose Mr. Quigley's amendment and to support the Danes, Lamborn, Lummis, Kramer amendment. And with that, I yield time to the distinguished congresswoman from Wyoming, Ms. Lummis. Gentlewoman from Wyoming is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition to the Quigley Amendment as well. It will defund the operation and maintenance of 150 of our land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles. Regardless of your stance on the nuclear triad, and we'll have that opportunity to discuss it later, it's irresponsible to stop funding maintenance of our nuclear weapons with no formal reduction plan. Are we supposed to leave warheads rotting in the silos? This amendment does not fund the decommissioning of warheads. If it did, a full-scale reduction of our force would be a costly endeavor, one that takes time and is a decision that should not be taken lightly. But it will effectively reduce our ICBM capabilities by one-third without any strategic considerations or multilateral negotiations with other nuclear powers. The Joint Chiefs have directly and explicitly recommended against a unilateral reduction. As the administration continues to weigh final force structure decisions scheduled to occur in FY15, I ask my colleagues to consider the consequences of removing this funding the year before. The mission of the Air Force Global Strike Command is to provide a safe, secure, effective nuclear deterrent force for the President of the United States. The Quigley Amendment would impede the Air Force's ability to fulfill that mission, preempts the President's force structure decision, and lacks feasibility without preparation. I urge you to oppose the Quigley Amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield the balance of my time to the gentleman from Montana. The gentleman from Montana is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I yield time now to the gentleman from California. The gentleman from California is recognized. Thank you. I rise in opposition to this amendment. This cut is not required by any treaty. There's no strategic analysis, as General Lady said. There's no estimate of how this would affect the balance between the United States and other nuclear powers. Events over the last several years, as well as through analysis, such as that done under the Nuclear Posture Review, have confirmed that we need to maintain and revitalize our nuclear deterrent. So I rise in strong opposition to this reckless amendment. And I yield the balance of my time to the gentleman from Montana. The gentleman yields back. Mr. Chairman, I'm always concerned when the Joint Chiefs have a strong opinion about our national defense. And given that these reductions have been directly and explicitly recommended against by the Joint Chiefs and senior DOD civilian officials, these, these gentlemen have all said that reductions must only be made bilaterally in concert with Russia. This is short-sighted, it's unwise, is a threat to our national security. Therefore, we oppose um, this unilateral reduction in our nuclear forces. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Illinois is recognized. Mr. Speaker, may I ask how much time is remaining? The gentleman has two minutes. Mr. Speaker, uh, before I uh, yield, let me just say this. I've been here four years now, and I now recognize what the Department of Defense is. It is our jobs program. I respect my colleagues defending jobs in their district, but this isn't about national security. It's about job maintenance. That is not what this is supposed to be about. If we're going to spend money creating jobs, I want to build bridges and schools and transit systems. Uh, and I, I yield the balance of my time to the gentleman from Indiana. Gentleman Appreciate from Indiana the uh, gentleman for yielding and uh, rise in strong support of his amendment, as I quoted in my opening remarks. Uh, rather than getting larger and more expensive over the past decade, the military has simply grown to be more expensive. 
And our world has fundamentally changed since the days of the Cold War, and certain aspects of our military and national security strategies have evolved. However, I do not believe that our nuclear weapons have had a corresponding change relative to our consideration uh, as to their deployment in numbers. Uh, I do think Congress has a very important role to play in helping the administration make rational decisions on the size and composition of the stockpile and the complex that supports it. And in talking about that complex, as a member of the Energy and Water Subcommittee, point out there are significant costs over and above those in this particular bill, uh, given the civilian control over the warheads at that particular department. Also, do not have a concern that in any way, shape, or form the gentleman is proposing that we unilaterally disarm this nation. I uh, believe that we certainly have adequate protection and support his amendment. Time of the gentleman has expired. All time expired. The questions on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Illinois. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. No. Opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The, the amendment speaker, is not I ask agreed for a recorded to. Vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Illinois will be postponed. It's now in order to consider Amendment Number 47, printed in the House Report 113-170. For what purpose does the gentleman from California seek recognition? Is this uh, Clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment Number 47, printed in House Report Number 113-170, offered by Mr. Denham of California. Pursuant to House Resolution 312, the gentleman from California, Mr. Denham, and a member opposed each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's crucial in this time of limited budgets that we transfer funds from those programs that are either duplicative or ineffective to the highest priority uses for the department, such as maintaining readiness and taking care of our personnel. With that in mind, I've introduced a limiting amendment to prohibit the Department of Defense from using funds to implement the Trans-Regional Web Initiative. This program consists of a series of general news websites that cater to foreign audiences. The department requested $19.7 million to continue this effort during fiscal year 2014. An April 2013 GAO report found that the TRWI program lacks meaningful performance metrics and is poorly coordinated with the U.S. government public diplomacy programs. I want to put this uh, $19.7 million in perspective. With this money, the Army National Guard could have retained 2,000 soldiers of its 4,000 it has been forced to reduce from its end strength due to budget cuts. That's 2,000 guardsmen who could be supporting our active component, responding to natural disasters or securing our border. Instead, that money is going to, be to websites providing entertainment news and lifestyle advice to the Balkans and Middle East. It's important to remember that the United States already spends hundreds of millions of dollars each year providing quality, independent journalism overseas through the Broadcasting Board of Governors. In fact, every week, more than 203 million listeners, viewers, and Internet users around the world engage with U.S. international broadcasting programs completely separate from the duplicative and expensive TRWI program. How can we possibly justify unnecessary and ineffective duplicative uh, measures by the Department of Defense? How can I tell someone in my district that they were furloughed because we found the cash to pay for an article about the plight of child actors in Turkey? Our colleagues in the Senate have already acted. The Senate Armed Services Committee found that the costs to operate the websites are excessive, the effectiveness of the websites is questionable, and the performance metrics do not justify the expense. I want to thank Citizens Against Government Waste, Taxpayers for Common Sense, and the Project on Government Oversight for their support on this amendment. Mr. Chairman, in this time of limited federal resources, we cannot afford to continue wasteful programs like this. Does the gentleman reserve the balance of his time? I return the balance of my time. Gentleman reserve. What purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey seek recognition? Uh, I rise to claim time in opposition to the gentleman. The gentleman from New Jersey amendment. is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in opposition to the amendment. Over the past 
several years, this committee has taken a very hard look at all of our military information operations programs. A very hard look. While the committee reduced or eliminated funding for those we judged not to be appropriate Defense Department activities, this was not one of them. This is a fully acknowledged program with each website sponsored by a geographic combatant commander. These websites provide important news and information about events in their region and U.S. activities being conducted in that region. These websites are an important opportunity for the United States government to inform foreign audiences about U.S. military activities in their region, including joint military training exercises or, very importantly, humanitarian assistance. Too often we find ourselves frustrated that foreign populations fail to appreciate the support they receive from the United States, particularly the United States military, or to understand the U.S. position on issues impacting their part of the world. This is often because people are unaware of our efforts. These websites offer the combatant commanders the ability to get the word out. And I believe, and we, the committee, believe that's important. Therefore, I urge rejection of the amendment and yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. I would be happy. To, uh, uh, can I? Can I yield?